we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed so I want to say that the servant's primary goal is to please the Lord 2nd Corinthians 5 from verse 1 to 10. It was read earlier on, but it's quite a time now. Just for us to refresh our mind on the first scripture reading, I want to go through from verse 1 to 10. For we know that if our earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, Longing to be clothed instead of our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed. Instead with a heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us... For this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in this body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and will prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I'll be dwelling so much on verse 9. So I'll read it as the big one. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Then the verse 10 supplies the reason why. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us, for the things done well in the body, whether good or bad. My intent this morning and this afternoon is not to be eschatological in my presentation. I'm not going to talk about the second coming of Christ, no. But to stress the fact that every good and purposeful life is led with the end in view. Every good and purposeful life is led with the end in view. End in view. The Bible says, the book of the law says, the precepts, the original idea is God's word. It says, the statutes, that has been placed by God says, the command of God says, the decree of the Almighty says, the word of God says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of the Lord to give account of what we did while in the body, whether good or bad. We shall stand before the judgment seat of the Lord, to give account of what we did while in the body, whether good or bad. We shall account for how we manage the opportunities God presented to us. We shall account for that. The way we married as husbands, the way we married our husbands, the way we led churches, the way we manage our spheres, the way we did politics, the way we traded. Whatever you are involved in, God will bring everything to account. So the Apostle Paul says, we make it our goal. He didn't say, I make it my goal. But we, because all of us, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There is no room for neutrality here. 
we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God to give an account. Suggesting to us that this is our primary goal as servants of the Lord. See, we are all primarily servants of God, not the people. Hmm. Paul says emphatically in Galatians 1 verse 10, I am now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God. Or am I trying to please people if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So we are primarily not men pleasers, but God pleases. Moses was a servant of God. Joshua 1 verse 1 and 2 quickly. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant is dead. So Moses was a servant of God. Romans 1 verse 1. Romans 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ. So Paul was a servant of Christ. 2 Peter 1 verse 1. Simon Peter a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So Peter was a servant of Christ. Jude 1, verse 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant John the Apostle. And in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 11, or well, let me take verse 4 for the sake of time. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. We are all servants of God. The God who created the world is interested in every department of it. Now, the fact that I'm a clergyman does not make me superior to any of you. Everything that you are doing as a teacher and nurse, God is interested in that department because all works together for the good of the creation. And so... I am not just speaking to the clergyman, even though this is a church, I am saying that every department that you are involved in, you must have the consciousness that you should please God. Because at the end of the day, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God and give account of whatever we did, whether good or bad. You may not believe what I'm saying, or take it if you don't have a Bible. But if you have anything superior to the Bible, then you can brush it aside. Otherwise, this is the precept, the original idea. But we serve men. Many have written books on servant leadership. And sometimes we stress it's to levels that we do not have to. And some pastors are interested in serving the people. But remember that you are not primarily a servant of the people. Apostle, you are not primarily the servant of CAC. You are a servant of God. Maybe. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 5, please. But what we preach is not ourselves. We don't preach ourselves. We don't even use this lectern or the pulpit to defend ourselves. No. We don't come behind the certain because of what we eat and wear. No. But Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake 
So we serve God's interest amongst the people. He says, your servants, for Jesus' sake. When we say for Jesus' sake, we mean for the cause of Jesus. So when the service to the people is not for the cause of Jesus, your master above will not be pleased with you. When we say for the sake of Jesus, we are saying on Jesus' account, when we say for Jesus' sake, we are saying that in the interest of Jesus or for the benefit of Jesus. So when we are serving the people, we must do that for Jesus' sake. It must be in the interest of Jesus and it must be for the benefit of his kingdom. We are primarily servants of God, not servants of the people. Maybe I should let Aaron speak. One day, Aaron gave in to the pressure from the people and made them a calf made of gold. Then when Moses came and said, what have you done? He says, it is the people. But God was not pleased. We are servants of God, not the servants of the people. We are servants of God. Our primary goal, as servants of God, therefore, is to please him. When Abraham was aged and about to die, one of his interests was to have Isaac, his son, Marry. So he told Eliezer, his chief servant, to go and fetch a wife for the son. Now let's listen to Eliezer's prayer in Genesis 24, verse 12. Then he prayed, this is the servant's prayer, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today. And show kindness to my master Abraham. Look at the prayer. He is not standing in the prayer anywhere. His interest in the prayer is his master. Now, when he found the wife, because of his own computation, and they took him home, verse 33 of the same chapter, 24, 33. Then food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I have told you what I have to say. Then tell us, Laban said. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. That is his introduction. It is not time for me to eat until my master's bidding is fully achieved. The servant's primary goal is to please the master. The servant's primary goal is to please the master. When we say primary, we mean the first or the highest in rank or importance. We are talking about the chief or the principal thing. So pleasing God should be the first of importance in all we do. Whether in word or deed, at home or at the workplace, in the closets or in the open, whether you are a minister of the gospel or you are a minister of state or a lay person, our primary goal is to please the Lord. So 1 Peter 3 verse 15 says, 1 Peter 3 verse 15. I'll take just the first part. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. The King James will say that, but in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. The first of importance. Set him apart. 
Anything else is secondary to the master's will. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. What is a goal? Let me talk about a goal. Especially those of us who are Ghanaians and we love soccer. The recent one that Ghana played. I was enjoying the beautiful game. And I was telling myself that Blaster is back. But we were still not getting the goal. The essence of playing the game and going to the field, what makes us excited is not the beautiful soccer, but the goal. So when we say pleasing the Lord is our primary goal, the goal is a resource or achievement towards which efforts are directed. As Christians, we make efforts to pray. We fast, we give towards sacrificial giving, we make effort towards preaching and teaching and what have you. We sing, we worship. All these efforts, if it does not culminate in us pleasing the Lord, then there could be exercises in futility. Prayer will result to nothing if at the end of the day, the one who lifts his hands is somebody that God is not happy with. There are some who, when they lift their hands in church, God turns his face. He is not interested in them. He is therefore not interested in their, in their hands. Our primary goal is to please the master. Our primary goal, my dear brother and chairman, is not to win souls. Our primary goal is not to open more assemblies and branches of CAC and Church of Pentecost. Our primary goal is not to see our ties performing well so that money will come into the church. That is not our primary goal. Our primary goal is not to build more houses and church buildings. Our primary goal is not to cause revivals. Our primary goal is not to heal the sick and raise the dead. No. Our primary goal is not to possess and transform society. But our primary goal is to please the master. Our primary goal is to act to the pleasure and satisfaction of God. Our primary goal is to make him happy. Our primary goal is to put a smile on his face. Our primary goal is to be obedient to his will. Our primary goal is to show ourselves approved of God. You see, there are so many ministers in this nation. What I think is that we don't even need to have any more. What we need is ministers approved of God. <laughs> ministers approved of God. Our primary goal is to have him always in our focus. Is to say and do what he would have said and done. Paul wants us to live our lives in such a way that our actions and inactions will bring delight to God. Life is open up before all of us. It is so fresh and bright, but God on high is watching. Life is open up before all of us, but God on high is watching. One day he told Abraham, now I know. What does that mean? That you fear the Lord. It means that all along he was testing his heart. Now I know. Now I know. Keep the primary goal always in focus. So we make it our goal to please him. It requires a conscious decision and effort to keep our primary goal in focus. Conscious decision and effort to always set before you the primary goal. Holding ourselves to the highest priority day in and day out. Seeking only to please him. 
See, the Apostle Paul is like a musician who gives no thought to the audience approver if he can only catch a look of approval from the conductor, then it is okay. The Apostle Paul says that when we are singing, the audience may not be applauding us, but you keep your eye on the conductor. As long as the conductor is saying this, keep singing. Because our primary goal is not to look at the audience, but to pay attention to the conductor. Pay attention to the conductor. Paul fears that we will displease God. Because to displease God is to grieve the Spirit of God. But it is the Spirit of God that we need for our work. So when you grieve him, who will stand behind you? To grieve in God is tantamount to quenching the Spirit's fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always associated with fire. From the day of Pentecost, we know that the Holy Spirit came with fire. Jesus said he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And grieving God is stifling this fire. As if you are suffocating God himself. First Thessalonians 5.19 says, Quench not the Spirit. That is the old King James. But the ESV says that, do not quench the spirit. If the word quench means die, then you can't kill the Holy Spirit. He is the creator God. But the NIV, the American version says, do not put out the spirit's fire. The fire that the spirits come with. Don't destroy it. You can't destroy the spirit because Jesus said he will be with you forever, but you can kill the fire. So he can be present with you, but not fiery. It is this fire which we will need as light in this dark world. This fire is the glory of his people. This fire shows us the way. This fire gives us warmth and energy to save. When you stifle this fire, where will be your strength? This fire drives away predators. This fire purges us and refines us. It dispels difficult and tough situations. Without this fire and this light, we will grow in darkness. And will be ineffective. Always keep the primary focus in view. It requires conscious effort to keep the primary focus in view. Our goal is to please him. The Bible says that it was time for kings to go to battle. But somehow David decided to stay at home. And whilst he was walking on top of his roof, he saw a naked body. Naked bodies are dangerous to behold. That is why we must all teach people how to dress well. Bodies are not supposed to be naked. It disturbs the human soul. Somehow, to fast track, David went for this woman whose husband was at the battlefield. Then the lady now brought him a report. I'm with a child. David, not knowing what to do, now, but remember that this one, a psalmist, David, a great man of God, now began to think what to do to save his shame. So called back Uriah from battle, attempted severally to get him home so that he would cover the pregnancy. But Uriah would not go home. Eventually, he killed this innocent man. He killed this innocent man. When the battle was over, the citizenry, they have heard that Uriah had been killed. 
Now David calls for Bathsheba to come and be the wife. To the average Israelite, this was a good gesture from the king. They will applaud the king because the husband went to war and the husband died and the king has graciously brought the wife to the palace as wife. People will clap for David. But let's listen to God's conclusion on the matter. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 26 and 27. I shall turn and face this wall and then I will read. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. The next verse is my interest. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But, any time that you are reading the Bible and you meet the word but, there's going to be a total U-turn. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. And the thing David had done displeased the Lord. It is now going to spell trouble for him. He thought he has covered it effectively. But God on high is, was always watching. He knows the details. He reads our motives. Why are you executive council members? God will read your motive. God will read your motive. <laughs> Apostle Chairman Elect, today God has chosen you to mount the chairmanship together with your EC members. But remember that just as your predecessors ascended and descended, this position, so will you. And remember that you shall give an account one day for your stewardship. So my advice to you based on scripture is try to please the Lord. <laughs> Let me conclude with a word from the master himself. John chapter 8. Verse 28 and 29. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The Father is the Master of the Lord Jesus Christ. I speak nothing. I do nothing on my own. And then can I respectfully ask that we all stand and we will take the last scripture. The one, ready, go. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Now listen. God will never leave you alone when you do what pleases him. But if he turns his back to you, you'll be in trouble. The one who sent me is always with me. He has not deserted me because I do what pleases him. Shall we lift up our hands and begin to pray in tongues? Basonde, Biria Satende. Whether you are a politician, whether you are a manager, whether you are a pastor, we must endeavor to please him because we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God and give an account of our still worship, whether good or bad. Shall we pray together in the name of Jesus? Shall we pray? You give an account of your marital life. How many wives do you have? How many husbands do you court? What are you doing? How did you come about that money? That big car, where did you get the money from? What are your connections? How are you scheming? How are you doing your politics? It all shall be brought into account. Shall we pray in the name of Jesus? 
Because of the sun, the